The Fenian Invasion of Canada West, 1866, created by the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada Museum and Archives. In the fall and winter of 1865 and the spring of 1866, there were rumors in Toronto of an imminent invasion of Canada by the Fenian Brotherhood. The militia was put on a heightened state of readiness and the Queen's Zone were called to active service on 7th March 1866 in anticipation of a St. Patrick's Day attack. They stayed on active duty for three weeks until the threat of invasion subsided. This was the beginning of the Fenian raids. The Fenian Brotherhood was an Irish-American organization that was dedicated to freeing Ireland from the British. Many of them were Civil War veterans who believed that if they captured Canada, they could use it as a bargaining tool against Britain. In the fall of 1865, they organized themselves into an army and began their preparations to invade Canada. In March 1866, they met in Cincinnati and formulated their plan. Unfortunately, their security was not very good and both the Canadian authorities and American government knew what they were planning. In the spring of 1866, flush with an influx of patriotic young men willing to defend their country due to the threat of Fenian invasion from the south, the Queen's own strength was well past 700 officers, sergeants and soldiers. They were equipped with a standard British service issue .577 caliber muzzle-loading Enfield, although, curiously, No. 5 Company on the way to battle were issued the Lever Action Spencer Repeating Rifle holding seven rounds of .52 caliber ammunition. All the Queen's Own wore the dark green tunics of rifle regiments. Fully equipped, they carried a great coat and 40 rounds of ammunition. Most had water bottles, but only a few had haversacks. Major Charles Gilmore, who commanded the Queen's Zone at Ridgeway, testified that they were, as a rule, partly drilled, some men undrilled. Recruits were joining every week and all available men, drilled and undrilled, were in the field. Gilmore further stated that half the regiment had never fired a shot in training and half were under the age of 20. The background photo shows the regiment practicing forming square to repel cavalry in 1863 at the grounds of the Normal School, Toronto, now Ryerson University. Major Charles T. Gilmore was an Irishman and had previous service with the Irish militia before joining the Queen's Own in 1863. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Drury, had been assigned duties as Deputy Adjutant General for Canada West and Gilmore had been acting commanding officer of the Queen's Own and would command the Queen's Own at the battle. Born in Canada, William D. Otter enrolled in the Queen's Own as a rifleman and worked his way through the ranks to be a captain and appointed adjutant in 1866. He would later go on to form the Infantry School which became the Royal Canadian Regiment of the Permanent Force. He was the first Canadian-born general and would command the Battleford Column during the Rebellion of 1885 and was in command of the Canadian Contingent during the South Africa War, 1899-1902. Born in Ireland, Robert Taylor had served in the 16th Regiment of Foot of the British Army before retiring to Toronto and joining the Queen's Zone. The Welland Canal was a critical trade link between Lake Erie Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence Seaway and was an obvious target for an invading force. On the evening of 31 May, groups of men are seen heading towards Black Rock, north of Buffalo. On the same evening, word goes out that the Queen's Zone is to muster at the drill shed on Simcoe Street. Buglers were literally going up and down the streets and sergeants were knocking on the doors of their soldiers. The Queen's Own were called out for the second time in three months. On the 1st of June at 3 a.m., the Fenian force of about 1,200 men under the command of Colonel O'Neill, a veteran cavalry commander of the Civil War, makes their way across the Niagara River from Black Rock, north of Buffalo, via barges pulled by steam tugs. They land about a mile north of Fort Erie. Meanwhile, 
the alarm had sounded in Toronto and across the province. Thousands of militiamen were called out. The Queen's Own Rifles paraded 356 men at 4 o'clock in the morning on the 1st of June. O'Neill's obvious objective was the Welland Canal, 13 miles west of where he landed. He did not comprehend his goal as such, probably because he did not see himself as a raider but as part of a larger operation. Therefore, he simply occupied Fort Erie, cut the telegraph wires and set fire to a railway bridge that linked Fort Erie with Port Colborne. Having no commissariat, O'Neill demanded breakfast for his troops, which was provided after the Reeve called a town meeting. He was unable to seize wagons or railway rolling stock because alarmed area residents had hitched them to a locomotive and pulled them out of town. At the same time, local farmers drove their livestock into the woods. At 6 a.m., the Queen's Own boarded the steamer City of Toronto and sailed for Port Dalhousie. The plan was for a combined force of Canadian volunteers to quickly secure the south end of the Welland Canal, then head north to link up with a larger force of British regulars and Canadian militia coming from the north, then defeat the Fenians as a combined force. Early in the morning of 1 June, the Queen's Own arrive at Port Dalhousie and board a train for Port Colborne. Having fed them, O'Neill moved his main body to a point near his landing and ordered his men to entrench at New Biggins Farm. This occupied most of their time while O'Neill awaited reinforcements from the United States. Extra arms had been moved across in anticipation of new recruits, but few arrived. Meanwhile, horses were at last secured and mounted scouts set out in all directions. Those sent towards Chippewa encountered a party of mounted farmers, fired on them and reported that they have dispersed Canadian cavalry. O'Neill's scouts carried proclamations that assured the Canadians that the invading forces had no quarrel with the people of Canada and encouraged everyone except the English and Scots to join them. The Queen's Own arrive at Port Colborn around midday and are billeted among citizens for dinner. Scouts report that the Fenians are camped at Fort Erie. The Queen's Own are joined by the York and Caledonian Rifle Companies and six companies of the 13th Battalion from Hamilton, now the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry. At four in the morning on the 2nd of June, they are joined by a further 125 Queen's Own men, making the force approximately 880 all told. As Gilmore was only a major, the force comes under command of Lieutenant Colonel Booker of the 13th Battalion. Colonel Peacock, who was commanding officer of the 16th Regiment of Foot, was placed in command of a combined force of British regulars, the 16th and 47th, and volunteer units, including the 10th Royal Grenadiers, who later became the Royal Regiment of Canada. His force numbered about 1,400 and included artillery and cavalry. They went via rail from Toronto through Hamilton and St. Catharines, staying overnight in Chippewa, aiming to link up with Booker's force the next day. O'Neill was not easily misled by rumours, and his scouts soon brought in reliable information of Canadian forces gathering at Chippewa and Port Colborn. As reinforcements were not arriving in numbers, there was no point in remaining near the landing point. By 3 a.m. on the 2nd of June, O'Neill had definite news about the Port Colborne force. Making a feint towards Chippewa as a deception, he broke camp and marched along a back road on the south side of Black Creek that intercepts the Lime Ridge Road, a highway that ran diagonally from the Niagara River to Ridgeway. At 5 a.m. on the 2nd of June, Booker's force, consisting of 880 men of the Queen's Zone, the 13th and the York and Caledonia Rifle Companies, departs Port Colborne for Ridgeway by rail. The Battle of Lime Ridge, sometimes called the Battle of Ridgeway. The paintings in this presentation are courtesy of the Fort Erie Museum and were painted by Alexander von Eriksson.
Here we see the Queen's own skirmish line in a wood line engaged with the enemy on the other side of a field. The Battle of Lime Ridge, Canadian Order of Battle. Ten companies of the Queen's Zone, including number five company equipped with the Lever Action Spencer repeating rifle, number eight Trinity College Company, number nine University College Company, and number ten Highland Company. The York Rifle Company, six companies of the 13th Battalion, and the Caledonia Rifle Company. Companies at the time normally consisted of around 50 officers, soldiers, and sergeants. The Battle of Lime Ridge, Fenian Order of Battle. The 13th Tennessee IRA Regiment of Nashville. The 18th Ohio IRA Regiment of Cleveland, called the Cleveland Rangers. The New Orleans Company, called the Louisiana Tigers. The 19th Ohio Regiment of Cincinnati, called the Irish Republic Volunteers the 17th Kentucky Regiment of Louisville, the 7th Buffalo Regiment called the Irish Liberation Army, and two companies from Haute, Indiana. Booker's orders were to march north from Ridgeway and rendezvous with Peacock at Stevensville, seven kilometers north. O'Neill and his Fenian army would, however, place themselves between the two Canadian forces with the intent to defeat the smaller force first before they could combine. When O'Neill's column reached the point where the road from Stevensville runs into the Lime Bridge Road, he heard the whistle of Booker's locomotive and the sound of bugles as Booker's force disembarked at Ridgeway, and he ordered his men to throw up breastworks. They would have time to do so, as Booker was still three miles away. O'Neill set up his defense on high ground just north of Ridgeway, where Forrest flanked the Lime Ridge Road at a distance of about a thousand yards on each side. O'Neill's mounted scouts brought him news of the Canadian presence. At the same time, O'Neill sent forward advance guards, probably around 150 strong, to occupy the orchards in front of his position. The advance guards moved forward to the Bertie Road, which lay parallel to the railway and intercepted the Lime Ridge Road about half a mile below O'Neill's main entrenchment. The Fenians made a barricade out of zigzag fences by taking their logs from the north side of the fence and transferring them to the south. This barricade extended along the Bertie Road for about 200 feet on the west side and about 400 on the east. A few hundred feet below the barricade, there were orchards on each side of the Lime Ridge Road. These were occupied by Fenian pickets, as was another clump of trees just southwest of these orchards, a half mile below the road. Booker's force advanced north from the Ridgeway Station up Lime Ridge Road. The action began around 8 a.m. when Ensign Alexandra Muir, future author of The Maple Leaf Forever of the 10th Highland Company of the Queen's Zone, noticed the Fenian pickets in the orchards. He reported, After proceeding about two and a half miles, I perceived a number of horses, between 12 and 15 in number, loose in an open field near the corner of a bush about three quarters of a mile in front of the left side of the road. These having attracted my attention, I also perceived a number of men flitting among the trees near the horses. I cried out, I see the Fenians, there are the Fenians. My discovery was made known to Colonel Booker who, perhaps from hearing the cry, came upon me. I was to the left hand from many of the Highland Company, the rear company of the battalion. Booker halted the column, examined the trees with field glasses and sent the leading number five company, the only company equipped with Spencer repeaters, forward as skirmishers. On sighting the enemy, the skirmishers signaled by waving their shakos on the ends of their rifles, at which moment Muir remembered. A bullet came whistling from the direction of the orchard. This was the first shot and came close to Captain Gardner and myself. Few casualties were sustained during this early exchange of fire at long range. When the firing began in earnest, Booker sent out numbers one and two companies of the Queen's Zone to deploy on his left with number eight and the Trinity College Company and number seven in support. The Fenian pickets fell back from the Canadian advance.
the independent rifle companies and the 13th Battalion held back below the garrison road in reserve, but they did not wait long for action. According to Colonel Booker, the Queen's Own, as skirmishers and support, slowly advanced, pushing back the enemy. We were gradually changing our point right to left when Major Gilmore wished me to relieve the Queen's Own and send the reserve as his men were falling short of ammunition, and that one company, number five, had no ammunition for their Spencer rifles. They had only been issued 28 rounds with no chance of replenishment. Booker agreed to relieving the Queen's Own. He ordered the York Rifles and the red-coated 13th Hamilton to deploy and relieve the Queen's Own. As Alexandra Muir of the Highland Company, who were on the right flank, put it, we continued advancing and firing for some distance, perhaps 300 yards at a time, when the orders came for the Queen's Own to fall back on its supports. We had been under fire three quarters of an hour. The 13th advanced in apparent good order towards the Queen's Own. They impressed Booker, who later recounted, Major Skinner commanded the 13th Battalion throughout with great gallantry. The movement was admirably executed. The York Rifles were on the left and Number 1 Company on the right of line. Apart from McLean's Number 6 Company, the skirmishers of the 13th were successful in carrying out the relief of the Queen's Zone. They continued to advance, driving the Fenian pickets out of the orchard and reaching the line of the Bertie Road. So far, Booker had every reason to be satisfied with the engagement. The Queen's Own, with the exception of Number 6 Company, were now in reserve, while the 13th Hamilton and the York Rifles continued to drive in the Fenian advance guard. At this point, the tide of the battle began to shift as the Fenian resistance stiffened. Looking through his field glasses, Booker observed Fenians entering the woods on the east side of the Ridge Road. He became anxious about his right, and the Highland Company of the Queen's Own was sent forward from the reserves to search the woods. The Highland Company pushed through the woods on the right flank. In the words of Alexandra Muir, after passing through a bush, we came to a wheat field on the opposite side of which we found the Fenians posted opposite our front and to our right. We commenced firing upon them as soon as we saw them, and they began to retreat. They were about 200 yards from us. We fired for some time until ordered to advance, and we leapt over the fence and entered the wheat field. We fired from the wheat field for some time. After entering the wheat field, I saw the 13th Battalion on my left, below me in skirmish order, advancing towards the enemy. As the battle reached its climax, the confusion and conflict increased. O'Neill had no way of telling whether he was contending with regulars or militia, or indeed of accurately knowing the strength of the forces opposed to him. Moreover, the Canadian left extended far beyond his right flank, and some of his own forces were preparing to retire. O'Neill, nevertheless, resolves on a counter-attack. Ensign McLean of the Queen's Own later reported that he saw Fenians advancing down the road. They were pushing forward their skirmishers and were advancing, as I thought, in heavy column of companies. They continued their advance and we received an order to retire. At this time, Muir, clearing the woods with the Highland Company, was in a position to watch the action. He reported that while the 13th Hamilton was advancing, I distinctly saw the enemy retreating a long distance before them before a bush in the rear. Suddenly they seemed to rally and came down upon the line of the 13th yelling. At this moment I saw a wavering in the line of the 13th. The Fenians advanced in loose manner but in great strength. Then the 13th retreated at the double, but I did not hear the retire sounded for that purpose. The Highland Company supported the 13th with long range fire until Sergeant Baines who was in a more elevated position, called out, retire. It was seen that the Canadian line was already under pressure and that some companies were wavering before their forces were thrown into confusion by an untoward incident. Some of the skirmishers noticed mounted officers urging the Fenian column forward and precipitatively raised the shout of, cavalry, look out for cavalry. 
Booker took the alarm seriously. He gave the reserve companies of the Queen's Own, numbers 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8, the fatal order to form square to repel horsemen. Private Robert Malm of the 13th Hamilton, who was acting as medical assistant, heard the cry of cavalry and the order to form square. He stated, I threw myself under the bayonets of the front face of the square. This square was composed of the Queen's Own and the color party of the 13th was still with them. A company of the 13th came up steadily, double, most of them at the trail, but some of them at the slope, and passing between the right face of the square formed in the rear of the Queen's Own. As soon as it was discovered that the alarm was a false one, the order was given to reform column and for the two leading companies, number one and two, to extend. On reforming, the reserve, being too close to the skirmish line, was ordered to retire. The left wing of the 13th, who were in the rear, seeing the four companies of the Queen's Own Reserve retiring, and thinking a general retreat had been ordered, broke and retired in a panic. On seeing this, the Queen's Own Reserve also hurriedly retired. Numbers one and two companies of the Queen's Own fell back and seeing their comrades in disorder, they too became demoralized. The Fenians, who were about ready to quit the fight and flee from the field when this unfortunate circumstance occurred, now saw their opportunity and were quick to avail themselves of it. Their rifle fire became hotter and more incessant than ever, and as the Canadian troops were all huddled up in a narrow road, their murderous volleys were very destructive. It was a case of order, counter-order, and disorder. Orders were given by bugle call, and the order to form square and to reform column caused some confusion among the hard-pressed skirmishers. The order to retire brought them in on a disintegrating square and their only recourse was to join the confusion. Captain Robert H. Davis of the Highland Company reported, When within about 500 yards of the enemy, we commenced firing. We crossed two fields on the other side of the crossroads called the Garrison Road. When I had formed my men by a fence to give them a direct line into the enemy and heard a bugle call, which my sergeant says would the retire. He said it was a mistake, that it was the advance which was meant. In a few minutes the advance was sounded and I took my company over the fence. When about halfway across the field, the retire was again sounded, followed by the double. I looked along the line of skirmishers and saw them firing and retiring and a few running. We retired then, the men firing occasionally. The officers, all of whom seemed to have kept their heads, did what they could to rally the men. Yet it was too much to ask partly trained men to retire in good order while under fire. Booker mounted his horse, ordering the bugler of the Queen's Own to sound the halt several times. Only two companies remained in fair order. The York Rifles, which had come in from the extreme left, and the 10th Highland Company of the Queen's Own, which had come in from the extreme right. These rallied by Captain Davis and Gardner, formed a rear guard, which retreated while firing at the advancing Fenians. The battle was over. The defeated militia withdrew, reaching Port Colborne at 3 p.m., 10 hours after their departure by rail. Reinforcements rushed to meet them at Port Colborne, but the Fenians were not inclined to pursue and headed back to the Niagara River with the intent to return to Buffalo. Of the 880 Canadians in action, 10 were killed, 9 from the Queen's Own and 1 from the 13th. There were 37 wounded, 21 from the Queen's Own, 15 from the 13th and 1 from the York Rifles. 4 of the Queen's Own and 2 from the 13th were taken prisoner. The reason for the higher losses of the Queen's Own was that they were under heavy fire while forming square and attempting to reform column. Fenian casualties were estimated at 10 dead and several wounded. For an engagement that lasted nearly two hours, 7.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., casualties were light on both sides. 
but it was not casualties that determined the outcome. As in any conflict between amateur and professional forces, the amateurs can hold their own for a while by offering a bold front, but when they begin to make mistakes, the game is over. Although evenly matched in numbers, the Fenians, being trained men, were bound to have the better of the firefight, as they could load and fire their muzzle loaders faster than untrained personnel. Marksmanship would not be an important factor when firing at targets 200 to 500 yards distant, unless the fire was directed against men in square or formed in columns. It seems that the mere sight of Fenians massing for counterattack had a disconcerting effect on the Canadian skirmishers. Given this and the intensity of Fenian fire, the militia in the centre were predisposed towards retreat. The bugle did the rest. British regulars and Canadian militia, including the 10th Royal Grenadiers, under the command of Colonel Peacock, were unable to make it to the battle in time. Despite setting a rigorous pace of march, they were only at Black Creek by the time the battle ended. A daring deed of bravery was performed by Private John H. Novair of No. 5 Company, Queen's Zone, while the battle was at its hottest stage. When Ensign McEachern received his fatal wound, his belts and sword were removed from his body and left in a fence corner. As the Fenians were working up in that direction, Novair determined to run the risk of recovering his dead comrades' equipments rather than have them fall into the hands of an exultant enemy. Therefore, he ran across the line of fire amid a storm of bullets, secured the sword and belts, and regained the Canadian lines unscathed just as the retreat began. The exertion of the race and the excessive heat proved too much for him, however, and he suffered sunstroke, which necessitated his being carried from the field and borne to Port Colborne by his comrades. From whence he was sent to hospital at St. Catharines for treatment and soon recovered. Private R. W. Hines of No. 8 Company, Queen Zone, was taken prisoner by a squad of Fenians and his rifle taken from him and handed to one of their officers. The officer took the rifle and, after eyeing it critically, grabbed it by the barrel and, with a profane remark that it would never shoot another Fenian, smashed the stock against a boulder. The Canadian gun, being loaded and at full cock, went off with a concussion, and the bullet passed through the Fenian's body, killing him instantly. It is related that a private of the Queen's Zone was in conflict with two Fenians who pressed him at the point of a bayonet. He retreated across a fence and fell. One of the Fenians dashed at him with his bayonet and pinned him to the ground, the bayonet passing through his arm. He pulled a revolver with the other hand and shot the Fenians one after another and escaped. The timing of the call to form square was a most disastrous occurrence, for in another ten minutes of fighting, General O'Neill's forces would have been defeated and in full retreat. In fact, O'Neill himself afterwards admitted this, and stated that if the Canadians had fought five minutes longer, his forces would have given way as they were fast becoming demoralized and were making preparations for flight. He complimented our men highly on their courage and steadiness, and said that he had mistaken them for regular British troops, and he could not believe that they were merely Canadian volunteers without any previous experience in warfare. Following the battle at Lyme Ridge, the Fenians, on their way to get back across the river, engaged and defeated another smaller group of militia. The majority of the Fenians were captured either by the American authorities or the Canadian forces. Many say that the Fenian raid encouraged the provinces of Canada to hasten confederation, which occurred just over a year later. Although there is still debate as to the causes of the defeat, the lack of proper training and equipment were definitely contributing factors. The government, possibly embarrassed by the defeat, did not recognize the sacrifice and bravery of the volunteers with a medal or land grants until almost 30 years later after pressure from veterans of the battle and the public. The citizens of Toronto erected the Volunteers Monument at Queen's Park in 1870 to honour and remember those who fell at the battle. The monument remains Toronto's oldest public monument.